I'm Dr. Philip Howard. I'm a consultant physician and gastroenterologist and have been for over 20 years now. So my interests are in the field of gastroenterology and general medicine. But I also have a number of patients with chronic neurodisability. And because I'm interested in nutrition and feeding problems, where we have patients with, for example, motor neuron disease or uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, um, they may occasionally require assistance with feeding. So as a gastroenterologist, I'm uh, used to placing feeding tubes in such patients. The Kenwood case is important because it's very simple. Since the time of Hippocrates, there's been a prohibition on deliberate killing of patients and assisted suicide. According to the Hippocratic Oath, it says, I will give no deadly drug to any, nor will I counsel such. And it was absolutely important for the medical profession when it started in ancient Greece over two and a half thousand years ago that patients were clear as to the role and function of doctors. They were there to cure, to help and to assist patients. They were not there ever or under any circumstances to kill their patients. And prior to that, the doctor was in a very powerful position. The person who could cure was also the person who could kill. So there's been an absolute prohibition on assisted suicide throughout the practice of medicine. In the civilized world, indeed in the pre-Christian world, for the last two and a half thousand years, it is an absolutely fundamental Rubicon that we must never cross. There's been a fundamental change in people's perception and perhaps the perception of the law regarding assisted suicide. Suicide used to be regarded as self-murder and was therefore a crime. And this led to very strange consequences. For example, if you attempted suicide and you were unsuccessful, then you could be convicted of a criminal offence. And I can still remember more senior doctors telling me as a junior doctor that if somebody survived a suicide attempt, they could nevertheless be arrested by the local constable and charged with an offence. Perhaps the most worrying and scandalous case was in 1944, the case of a suicide pact, the case of R.V. Croft, the survivor in that case was convicted of murder and executed. There was then a change in the Homicide Act, but it wasn't really until 1961 that there was a major change in the law on suicide. And what the 1961 Act did was to decriminalise suicide as far as the victim was concerned. Clearly, if the individual had killed themselves, they were beyond the law. But they shouldn't be convicted of the crime of trying to take their own life. And that was really a humanitarian move and supported by the medical profession. Those who are sufficiently distressed and in great difficulty, such that they attempt to take their lives, should be dealt humanely by the medical profession and by society, not by the law. They should be helped and not punished. And that is why in 1961 the Suicide Act decriminalised suicide as far as the individual was concerned. It wasn't a recognition by society that suicide was unimportant. Quite the opposite. It was a recognition that it was important, it was significant for society, and it should be dealt with in a humane and a humanitarian fashion. Not by the law, but by the medical profession. At the same time, it introduced the crime of assisting in suicide. 
or what the Coroners and Justice Act calls assisting or encouraging suicide. It means the same thing. And this was a recognition that suicide was a serious matter for society. And the Suicide Act 1961 was not going to open the floodgates to allow people to assist in something which was rightly no longer regarded as a crime for the individual. The criteria for a prosecution, as with many uh, criminal acts, was firstly whether there was sufficient evidence to convict, and secondly whether or not it was in the public interest to convict. Because of that, and because of the uncertainties in the law, the DPP issued guidance, and that is the subject of the current case. Now, it's very important to realise that the whole issue of suicide, both with respect to society and the medical profession, can be altered by what may otherwise be seen as a slight change in terms of policy, which might belie the underlying attitude or may suggest a change in attitude. And therefore, if the guidance is ambiguous, it may suggest a change in the moral and legal perception of society, of the legal profession, and indeed of the medical profession. It's a little bit like climate change. A small increase in ambient temperature, a small increase in water level of our oceans, could lead to a dramatic change in the landscape and in the environment. If we do not maintain very clear guidance on the question of suicide and assisted suicide, then a very small change in the guidance could cause a very significant and very real change in the attitude of patients and society towards this whole issue. It is very important that when, for example, a distressed person engages in deliberate self-harm, tries to take their own life, for example, with an overdose, that when they go to hospital, they know that the doctors and nurses caring for them will not take that opportunity ever to take their lives. That they are there unambiguously to help, support and hopefully to prevent what is, after all, a very distressing issue, clearly for the patient, but also for those that they might otherwise leave behind if they are to die. The previous guidance was clear that healthcare professionals, in particular doctors, should not be involved in encouraging or assisted suicide. And it's very important for us when we have patients who have tried to take their own lives, for example, that we have complete confidence in those to whom we refer for support, for psychiatric help and further advice, that that other healthcare professional is not going to take that opportunity to encourage or assist that person's suicide. So there's always been an absolute prohibition for doctors not to take the lives of patients to deliver lethal medication or to encourage suicide. We must not cross that Rubicon. And there's no doubt that the previous guidance would made it, made it quite clear that doctors who did that were more likely to be prosecuted. That was also the view of the BMA and of the GMC. But an ambiguity crept in, in so far as doctors who were not responsible for the care of the patient may not be prosecuted. 
What does that mean? When can a doctor or other healthcare professional not be responsible for the help and advice that they give a patient? The good or bad advice that they give to a patient? And are we really going to say that if it's not my patient in my bed on a hospital ward that I'm entitled to advise that patient to take their life, for example? So there's ambiguity in the current guidance. Ambiguity that simply must not be there. Ambiguity that must not encourage doctors and nurses and those involved in the care of those who are distressed and often depressed, encouraging them perhaps, or at least leaving them with a certain amount of ambiguity as to whether or not in their particular set of circumstances it may not be such a bad idea if they were to take their own life. That is a Rubicon that we must not cross. We are there to help and advise and support individuals. One of the reasons that the law changed was because of the recognition that the overwhelming majority of patients that made serious attempts to take their own life often suffered from mental illness and depression, may have addiction or alcohol problems, or had difficult and distressing social circumstances. Under those circumstances, and in that context, it is absolutely essential that doctors, nurses, psychiatrists, social workers help individuals in distress to overcome their problems and not to encourage or assist in their suicide.